that many times when an incident happens, the incident has a certain amount of resonance for a certain amount of time, and then the intensity just naturally drains away. And we made a commitment that period of time ago when we created this committee to not let it drain away, that we were going to take seriously the study that was um, uh, we'd undertaken. And of course, the, the governor of the day then uh, required us to do something by April 1st of 2021. And we, we met that mark, as did other jurisdictions. But now, in the year plus since, we're committed to trying to implement the ideas of that action plan. And tonight is an opportunity to go through the status of many of those uh, proposals that were proposals then and are now actual policy today. I want to thank both Mayo and Leroy for their ongoing work. They don't have to do this much work. They're both men of accomplishment uh, who've done a lot already uh, in the field of law, in the field of social justice, and they took this on as an additional task, and we're grateful to both of them uh, for their work, and now the work continues. I want to thank Commissioner Tom Gleason. Many of the suggestions that came out of this committee the things that Tom uh, was already uh, implementing or had implemented. And uh, the, the dialogue, however, gave us the opportunity to add some additional new ideas, some technology things. And of course, as you're going to hear tonight, uh, the great uh, cooperative relationship between our Department of Community Mental Health and our Public Safety Department with the uh, Project Alliance project. But tonight is a, uh, is a point on a process. It is not an ending point. It is a point of continuation. And after we have a chance to assess how far we've come, there's still you know, land for us to travel. And I don't want to act as if some of the areas we'd be at ahead of us aren't controversial. We have work to do. We have uh, some legitimate disagreements uh, that will be you know, discussed and negotiated through with all sides being respected. But we have come a long distance, and I'm personally grateful to all the players in the game. And uh, I think this is, you know, in essence, what... Self-governance is, this is, you know, individual human beings. We don't turn to a king or uh, a ruler. We work amongst ourselves and try to figure out how do we work through this moment. And I'm very proud of this full committee that uh, you've stayed engaged and you've stayed productive. I also want to thank all of the, uh, the people, the staff people, uh, those who are here in the room, uh, as well as those that are not in the room, Crystal Collins, as she may be here remotely, uh, because uh, Blanca and all of us have really, uh, um, benefited because of their work. And so thank you. So uh, those are my opening comments. I gladly turn it over to Mayo and Leroy to take it from here. Uh, I will personally join you remotely from this point forward because I got one of my usual crazy nights. But uh, it's always good to be with you. And thank you again for your hard work. Thank you, County Executive Latimer uh, and your staff. Uh, very happy to be here with you tonight. And uh, I want to take my time to issue some well-deserved thanks. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, all, first of all, for shining the spotlight on this important issue. I also want to thank all the members of the task force, because the work could not have been done without all of you. Each of you shared ideas and thoughts on this, uh, these important issues and helped shape what became our final report and recommendations. Uh, special thanks to the liaisons uh, from whom who worked tirelessly with each working group and communicated their work back to the task force at large. Each of you, we, I can't say enough about the hard work that you did. And I wanted to publicly acknowledge you. Uh, of course, Blanca Lopez, uh, Crystal Collins, Copernicus Crane from the County Exec's Office, uh, also Perry Cadenoff from the Westchester County Solid Waste Commission, Cheryl M. Pulver from the Westchester County Probation Department, and Jason Whitehead from the Westchester County Law Department. Uh, we spent a lot of time together, and it's nice to see that uh, a lot of that hard work is coming to uh, fruition. I will have a special thanks uh, in joining the county executive and thanking uh, Commissioner Gleason. Uh, Commissioner Gleason has been cooperative and responsive um, from the outset with the task force. Many times he acted on and implemented ideas as they were discussed during deliberations. And by following up, enforcing, and reporting on the implementation of recommendation, he is largely responsible for much of the information that we will share with you tonight. It has been a personal pleasure to participate in the work of the task force, but also exceedingly rewarding to follow up on its implementation and therefore demonstrate that Westchester County is moving forward with this important work. Lastly, I want to publicly 
state what a pleasure it has been to work alongside my co-chair, Mayo Bartlett, and sharing his knowledge and understanding of the nuances that come into play in this work. We look forward to uh, continuing to work together and we look forward to uh, continuing to pursue uh, this important work. Mayo. Thank you very much, Leroy. And I echo all of Leroy's sentiment and um, certainly thank County Executive Latimer for his leadership and his vision. I've always been struck by the fact that uh, the work was something he anticipated before the governor's executive order. I think that that speaks volumes. Uh, it's been a true pleasure working with you, Leroy, as well as with uh, all of our liaisons and our department heads and everyone who took time uh, to really engage in, in thoughtful discourse and to propose uh, ways that we can make the police department the best that it can be and ideally that we can be a model for other departments. And I have to also say that uh, the conversations I've found to be tremendously rewarding and I've learned a lot uh, by just the give and take and not necessarily by uh, hearing what would have been my opinion, but by being able to take time to listen to the various um, perceptions because I think that different perspectives help us to be effective moving forward. And one of the reasons that we're here today is because um, as the county executive stated, every municipality was charged with doing the work that we did. And we have spent a tremendous amount of time uh, reviewing other municipalities' work and looking at what went into it. Uh, some, of, some of the municipalities didn't even have to engage in the effort and others did. Um, but one of the things that we consistently hear from members of the community is, uh, you know, that they don't know what the status is or whether anything is actually being done. And sometimes uh, unfairly people will think that nothing has occurred and uh, they don't necessarily realize what goes into some of the proposals and some of the changes. For instance, what is required, uh, uh, what requires state action, you know, what requires legislative action. So we're very happy uh, to be able to come back and talk about some of the things that have already been implemented. And as Leroy said, uh, Commissioner Gleason has been outstanding uh, from the beginning in terms of his uh, openness, willingness to have open dialogue, uh, and also uh, adopting some of the recommendations before they were even formally voted on. So whether it was uh, listening and dealing with, with Commissioner Gleason, or we were talking with uh, some of the other members of the department, uh, the interaction I found at least to be uh, very constructive, very positive in terms of helping us to move forward. And I think uh, in particular, I remember many conversations with Lieutenant Alonji who gave us a lot of great suggestions about ways we'd be able to do things uh, that could enhance what's happening in the police academy and thereby uh, increase our ability to reach young recruits and sometimes people who've transferred from the outside. So this will be an opportunity for us to talk a bit about what's being done to give you an idea of some of the things that have not yet been implemented, but at least to give you um, an idea of where we are and, and what some of the, uh, I won't even say hurdles or issues, but what some of the working uh, uh, process is that would allow us to move forward and some of the things that we have to deal with in terms of uh, legislative considerations and dealing with uh, the County Board of Legislators and allowing them to go through their process. So again, I, I couldn't thank you enough. Um, the work that was put into this effort was tremendous. Um, having served with Leroy on each and every uh, working group, you know, I can tell you that every single person took it tremendously seriously, dedicated their time and their effort. And um, I'm sincere in my belief that everybody did so in an effort to strengthen Westchester County and for us to be the best department that we could be. But thank you very much. Thank you, Mayo and Leroy, for your welcoming remarks. Um, as Copper shares his screen to um, put up the first presentation um, as we transition into the next item on the agenda, I personally want to um, thank all of you for being here virtually again. Um, but it's been over a year since this task force met. And we are very excited to share with all of you all of the great progress that we have done, um, focusing primarily on the 38 recommendations that were referred for executive action. And much of that work fell um, 
under the responsibility of Commissioner Gleason and his staff at the Department of Public Safety. Um, our approach to implementing um, these recommendations varied. While Commissioner Gleason and his staff focused on a lot of these recommendations um, from the 38, there were about 33 that he's been focusing on. There was one particular recommendation that uh, we thought it would be great to approach differently. And this had to do with how to respond to mental health calls countywide. And what additional co-initiatives um, can we introduce to focus on this specific recommendation? Um, Copper, if you can go on the first slide, please. So in order to do this, right after we submitted our report on April 1st, following the governor's, uh, then Governor Cuomo's executive order 203, um, Director of Operations Joe McDonald convened a working group to focus on that one specific recommendation that had to do with mental health crisis calls. And the working team was made up of commissioners from the Department of Community Mental Health, Department of Public Safety, Department of Social Services, and the Department of Emergency Services, as well as a representative from the County Executive's Office. And we were tasked to developing a response um, that we knew would not uh, be the response that you could only that you could only approach single-handedly. It had to be a multi-pronged approach, and this um, set of recommendations became Project Alliance. So the working group met from April to June in order to discuss and review what type of responses we would have to develop and create in order to address that one particular recommendation. And this presentation will focus on the development of the five-pronged approaches that make up Project Alliance, as well as give you an up update as to where we are with, with each of these recommendations. Um, and for this, I want to introduce Commissioner Orth from the Department of Community Mental Health, as well as Program Director Mark Giuliano. So, Mark, take it away. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for all the work that you put into this. And as we were speaking before we began the presentation, we were talking about the fact that some of these, um, some of these uh, programs, initiatives are things that we've been working on for quite some time. But once we got the, the momentum of the county executive's office behind us and the task force behind us, things really began to fall, uh, fall into place. And I feel like we're moving at about a million miles an hour, uh, trying to keep up with all the rec recommendations and get everything put into place. If you can move to the next slide, we'll take a look at the five-prong approach to Project Alliance. So the five elements that made up Project Alliance are 911 diversion. We took a look around uh, New York State as well as the United States to see where we might be able to divert the call at the first possible, uh, per first possible level and began to think about how we might be able to create a system that's based on the person's risk, their level of need, so that we could be responsive in a meaningful way. So we can get the right service to the right person at the right time. We recognize that many times when people call law enforcement or they dial 911, they're dialing because they don't know who else to call. Um, so many times law enforcement becomes involved in a situation that doesn't really require that level of involvement. It's not necessarily a public safety issue. The person just doesn't know who to call. So 911 diversion is the first part of Project Alliance, and it ties into the next piece, which is our Enhanced Behavioral Health Crisis Line. On December uh, 1st of 2021, uh, St. Vincent's became, uh, St. Vincent's Crisis Network team took over the responsibility of uh, delivering services through the Behavioral Health Crisis Line. And as of July 16th, 2022, they will become 988. If you're not familiar with 988, if you were to be in a state of suicidal crisis right now, you would have to call 1-800-273-TALK, which is pretty complicated. If you're uh, struggling with thoughts of suicide and you're overwhelmed to transfer the numbers of TALK into a numeric sequence just becomes a little overwhelming. 
So nationally, uh, 1-800-273-TALK will become 988. And the same team that's providing intervention through the Crisis Network team will also begin to provide services through uh, 988 locally. And if you were to call today, uh, you might get a call taker up in Canandaigua, New York. Um, our team, once they become operational, fully operational in July of this year, will have the local knowledge of the local resource and connect the citizens of Westchester County to the appropriate resources. So that's going to be a, a, a huge asset to our system. And they've already begun to launch that because of the fact that they've launched the, the Enhanced Behavioral Health Line. EMS Behavioral Health Response. We know that many times law enforcement, EMS, and now first responders in the way, uh, by the way of uh, mobile crisis response teams will be responding to telephone calls and crisis situations in the community. And we wanna make sure that EMS has the same level of training, that they have the same knowledge, that they have the same understanding, that they understand the laws that are relevant to um, a tra uh, transporting a person to a hospital if that's what's appropriate, that they understand that they're, where their responsibility begins and ends. So we decided uh, as a group that we would also begin to put together an enhanced training for EMS providers. Uh, we have been delivering crisis intervention team training in Westchester County th since 2006. Uh, in 2007, 2008, we brought in the team from the city of Rochester. They were really the pioneers in New York State. But from then, I realized that we had local resources, and it made a lot more sense to have the psychiatrist in the local emergency department do the presentation. It made more sense for uh, Detective Barber, who's been a great partner with us at the Department of Public Safety, to co-present the material. Rob and I have been teaching for, for uh, seven or eight years already it didn't make sense from my perspective to bring in outside resources when we had the talent here one of the things that we know with our cit training is that we have had lots of cit trained officers but we haven't had the development of too many cit formal teams and that's one of the big misconceptions about cit is that people think that CIT is a police training program. It's not a police training program. The training is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's about building a team with the mental health community, with people with lived experience who've been in crisis, with their family members to respond to that behavioral health crisis in the community. Because law enforcement, honestly, they can't do it alone. We're asking them to do a tremendous amount when it comes to uh, addressing behavioral health needs and we wanna make sure that they have the right support. So on the other side of the coin, the mental health system needs to be responsive and the social service system needs to be responsive. And then finally, the last piece of this puzzle is the development of the eight mobile crisis response teams, which will be available and co-located within local police departments. And they're taking on that first responder model in that they'll be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It adds a dispatch option to, the, uh, to, to the, the desk sergeant or to the call taker, the dispatcher. Right now, if it turned out that you had a fire in your home, you would dispatch the fire department. If you had a medical emergency, you would dispatch or they, that call taker would dispatch an ambulance. If you had a public safety issue, you would dispatch the police. And if you had a mental health crisis, you would dispatch the police. And if you had a substance use crisis, you would dispatch the police. We're looking to change that mindset because we want to make sure that if it's a behavioral health crisis, whether it be because of an intellectual or developmental disability, whether it be because of a substance use issue, or whether it be because of an exacerbation of a mental health condition, that we're getting a mental health team that can provide the appropriate level of response and the same level of, as any other first responder. Let's move on to the next slide. This Mark, was Mark, do you mind if I just add something? Hi, this is Michael Orth. I'm also with DCMH, and I apologize I could not be there. But I just, in terms of the milestones, what I think is really important, what Mark is saying is when, when, when the when the uh, plan was uh, first released, our director of operations, Joan O'Brien uh, McDonald, uh, asked all of us in the departments to come together, and we really looked at the local plans. Uh, we spoke to people with lived experience. Commissioner Gleason, Commissioner Wishney, Commissioner Towns, we all came together. And that's how we came up with this five prong approach. It took us several weeks and months of brainstorming to really look at things we already have in place, as Mark said, but also looking at different responses. 
And I think it was important that we also wanted to um, really reflect Westchester County. We recognize that um, we wanted shared leadership, ownership. We wanted a community-based model, recognizing um, the strengths of our community, the resources locally, and really use some of the best practices. But it was important that it was locally based and also sustainable. So really thanks to Director of Operations, Joe McDonald, and of course, Deputy Commissioner Lopez, um, uh, we really started working together as a team um, and to come together with this five-pronged approach. So I just wanted to add that, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate that. If we move into the next slide, we'll begin to take a look at 911 diversion training. As I said, uh, this began in New York State in Broome County. Uh, Lieutenant Mike Hatch, retired from Johnson City Police Department, had begun to put a protocol in place based on work that was done in other communities throughout the United States. He took a look at how they were handling calls in Houston and Dallas and out in New Mexico and looking at the crisis now model adopted this risk assessment tool to help divert people away from the emergency room if we possibly can. <laughs> um, many times law enforcement's frustrated because at this point, if it turned out that a person issued, uttered the word suicide, immediately the person would have to be extricated from their home, taken down to the hospital for that evaluation. This tool gives us the opportunity to screen out those calls in which there's a lower risk of uh, a lower risk and a lower risk of suicide or homicide by simply asking a couple of questions. And as you take a look at that tool and you can walk down the tool, you'll see that we begin to ask whether the person's experiencing thoughts of suicide right now. We're asking if they have the means. Uh, do they have a plan? And how they would, uh, do they have a time frame in which they might do this? And if the person says, well, I am having really dark thoughts, I'm having thoughts of suicide, but I have to be honest with you, I wouldn't do it until the anniversary of my wife's death next September. That's not an imminent risk and an imminent need. That means that we have an opportunity to add, to uh, d divert that telephone call over to a trained mental health professional. Many people in the community have asked the question of liability. Where's the liability fall if it turns out that a dispatcher or call taker or desk officer uh, divert, diverts that call over to a member of the crisis network team, which is the Enhanced Behavioral Health Line? And our question back to them is, where does, a li where does it appear to have more liability? If we forcibly have to extricate someone to their house for the purpose of getting them evaluated, or we have a direct connection to a mental health counselor who's got six years of training, plus some licensure, plus the appropriate clinical supervision. And if it turns out that the call heats up and we need to get eyes on, we can always ask for additional resources. Where does a liability seem to, to fall? If it turns out that we end up having to hurt or injure that person who's in crisis because we had to take them out of the house when they didn't want to go, have the possibility of hurting or injuring a, a police officer in the process or EMS, or if we can get that person co connected directly to uh, a telephonic crisis interventionist, it seems like that would be the better choice. Uh, when they took a look at the model out in Broome County, they found out of the first 100 cases, 95% of those cases were referred over to a member of the crisis network team without having to go to the hospital. There were five that had to come back to, to, assess, uh, to ask for additional resources. One, the call ramped up. They really needed the additional resources. There were four others in the community that simply needed a ride to the hospital and the call didn't ramp up. They were calling to ask for an ambulance to come out to the house. So if, we, if we're at a 99% success rate in uh, Broome County, that's fantastic. In Westchester, we've broadened the scope of uh, responses because not only do we have the opportunity to have people speak to someone on the phone, but with the use of our mobile crisis response teams, we can put a mental health eyes on approach to the assessment for that individual. So we can really, if it turns out that we feel that there's a level of risk, we can get the right service to the right person at the right time. So move on to the next slide, please. At this point, I believe we have trained 426 uh, dispatchers, call takers, and desk officers. We started last July. Uh, we've done most of the training at uh, the, the, the Westchester County Police Training Academy. Lieutenant Alonji and uh, the Department of Public Safety have been great partners 
in helping us get this, uh, the, this up and running and launched as well as the Department of Emergency Services. Some of the initial, uh, some of the initial training was done at the uh, Department of Emergency Services and we had all of the, um, all, all of the call takers from 60 control on emergency service have been trained. The call takers for Westchester County um, Department of Public Safety have been sa been trained. And uh, I love last count I had, I had 30 of the 39 PSAPs have had staff trained. We spent a tremendous time in the, in the city of New Rochelle. The director of training uh, down there, Eddie Hayes said, this is not only good for our call takers, our communications personnel, but it's a great uh, refresher training for law enforcement officers on how to work with people with mental health concerns. So we've dedicated staff to provide training to them every Monday from the beginning of uh, February, and we'll end that on May the 16th. We'll have gotten through every police officer in the city of New Rochelle. The Portchester Police Department has had all of their personnel come through the training as well uh, because they, they think it's that important. Once again, we've put into place this risk responsivity approach Zero at the bottom is someone who just needs somebody to speak to. If you've got somebody who is, we consider a, a level one risk, well, that's, that's somebody who needs somebody to speak to, but maybe experiencing some thoughts of suicide, but we can do a telephonic intervention. When we move to that crisis level two, that's somebody who we want to probably want to put some eyes on. And whether it be a CIT trained officer, which we'll speak about momentarily, or whether it be a member of the mobile crisis team. Level three, we're moving more towards the law enforcement intervention, having mobile crisis as, uh, out there as well. And when we look at level four, that's really a public safety issue. And from the very beginning of, uh, the, of police reform on social media, on regular media, and even some of the officers I spoke to, I've heard them say, yeah, I wanna see what happens when it's two o'clock in the morning and you've got the guy who's sweating profusely with a machete who's out in the community. I wanna see what the social worker is gonna do then. We're not coming on that call. We're coming, but if we're coming, we're staged to the side, that's a public safety issue. And law enforcement knows how to secure the scene in those situations. We'll act as a resource, but that's that should be the last resort. And that's one of the first things that we wanna get across here is that for far too long, we've asked law enforcement to be our first response in dealing with mental health crisis. It should only be the, the last resort when we've got somebody who's in a state of uh, mental health crisis. A mental health emergency, emergency should be met with a mental health response. Move on to the next slide. Crisis Network Team, our Enhanced Behavioral Health Line. Uh, our uh, partners in this began to launch the Enhanced Behavioral Health uh, Line in December of 2021. And then the beginning, the first couple of months, they only received six calls per month. Six calls were diverted. Well, this is a new process. The desk officers, call takers, dispatchers have to get used to the process. And in the very beginning, much of law enforcement is driven by policy, which makes a lot of sense, policies and procedures. And many of the police departments didn't have policies and procedures in place in order to support the diversion of these telephone calls to a member of the crisis network team. By the time we get up to March, we're now at uh, 19 calls diverted. In the very first week of April, we had seven calls diverted. So I'm going to suggest that that number will continue to climb as the policies and procedures go into place. And we get a practice in which the, uh, the desk officer, the dispatcher, communication personnel feels a level of trust that a member of the crisis network team is going to pick up the call and handle the call. The vast majority of the calls have not required any additional resources. They were de-escalated. The person simply needed someone to speak to. At the same time, same team is charged with the implementation of 988 and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They began to accept calls locally on a trial basis on March the 1st. The hours of operation were from 12 noon to 4 p.m. The rest of the calls are being handled as they would have been prior to the implementation of 988 here in Westchester. They would go to the person up in Canandaigua uh, who, who would then triage the call. And in the month of March, they ended up picking up 60 calls from 988. 
or the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. In April, within the first week, they had 29 calls. So once again, we anticipate that that is going to eclipse the numbers that they had within the first month. Uh, the As of April the 1st, uh, the, the phone line went live from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So they're slowly expanding their hours as they're ramping up the staff. And as I said before, it will become active 24 hours a day, seven days a week, starting July 16th of 2022. So we can move to the next slide. This has been a challenge. No doubt this has been a challenge. Enhanced uh, CIT training for EMS personnel. If you take a look at the EMS personnel throughout Westchester County, they're reliant largely on a volunteer workforce. Uh, and we've got lots of great ideas on how we can put uh, a 40 hour training together to provide a comprehensive training to EMS personnel, but it's really difficult to get volunteers to sit in, an order, in, a, in a room for an hour and dedicate, and dedicate 40 hours, I'm sorry, dedicate uh, 40 hours of their life to, to a training, uh, despite the fact that it's tremendously important for what we're looking to accomplish. We're looking at different strategies in which we might be able to roll out uh, some of this. There are some EMS personnel who are particularly interested and we'll be there for the full 40 hours. We've had EMS personnel over the, uh, over the past 15 years or so that we've been delivering CIT training. We've had some EMS personnel sit in as well as some firefighters. Uh, but we are probably going to need to take a step back and see how we might be able to make this more, training more accessible to our EMS personnel out there in the community. Uh, we know that dealing with a volunteer workforce makes things challenging in this regard. So we, we haven't accomplished as much here. This has not been our focus. We will get back to EMS training at some point. We've been focused on 911 diversion training as well as the CIT training and the rollout of the mobile crisis teams. So let's move into the, uh, the CIT training, which is our, should be our next slide. All right, so you've got uh, CIT training that's been delivered in the city of Mount Vernon. Uh, that's your lower picture on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, you will see one of our presenters who is, uh, who's got lived experience. She's a woman who struggles with um, her mental health concerns. She, has, she lives with 12 voices, and she says when she does her presentation, she's number 13, and she relates to the, the audience, whether it be new recruits or whether it be to the experienced officers, uh, that she's experiencing auditory hallucinations while she's doing her presentation. They have an opportunity to ask her. She's very candid about what it's like to live with auditory hallucinations. We want them to see people when they're not in a state of crisis. And Kim has been a real asset to us, as have our other presenters uh, that have come in and shared their lived experience from a family perspective and from a, the perspective of a person who's had to receive mental health concerns. Up in the top of the screen, I believe that was our last recruit academy class, very large class. The one thing I will say in uh, as far as the recruits, uh, the, the Westchester County Department of Public Safety, once again, huge, huge partner with us in this. We've been delivering this training collaboratively for many, many years. And in Westchester, we exceed the state expectation for training for new recruits. The state requires 21 hours of training. We exceed that and deliver a full 40 hours of training. I don't consider them CIT trained officers because we have, when we're looking to build the team, they're coming in and they're getting the enhanced fundamentals of CIT, the full 40 hours of training, but to really be a team, we need to bring in some of the other outside resources to be a partner with. It's a small, not, it's not a small, it's a substantial, but a small, still a small part of the training that they receive in the academy. And we also place a specific focus in both the experienced officer training, as well as the training that's done for the recruits on emotional wellness for the officers themselves. We want them to be well. We want them to be well adjusted. We want them to not have to struggle with symptoms of acute stress or post-traumatic stress disorder or worst case scenario, struggle with the risk of suicide because we know that the risk of suicide for uniformed personnel is much higher than the rest of the population. And if we can keep them well and well adjusted, the best beneficiary out in the community are going to be the members of the community that they're sworn to protect and serve. Their families will benefit. They benefit. 
So we want to make sure that they do well. In fact, what we've done over the past few years is we've uh, brought in a clergy member from the Porchester Police. He also serves as clergy within the White Plains Police Department and the MTA. He's done training for uh, the NYPD. He is a licensed mental health counselor as well as a Shin Yuen Buddhist priest. We do a mindfulness section uh, to help them uh, get centered in be not first reactors, but first responders. And none of this could have happened without our partnership with the Department of Public Safety, as well as the Department of Emergency Services within this. On the right hand side of the screen, you see an officer who's trying out some of his new found skills to help engage and de-escalate someone in a uh, in an interactive scenario training. Let's move on to the next slide. So since we began Project Alliance, as I said, we've been we've been delivering CIT training for many years. And with the support of all of you in this room and the county executive office, we've really begun to uh, to take off in what we've been doing. But since we started here, 28 experienced officers have been trained in CIT training. We've had 76 new police recruits who've received the uh, fundamentals of crisis intervention exceeding the 21 hours that the state would expect of us. We've delivered uh, de CIT training uh, to the Mount Vernon Police Department, and we've done in-service training to SUNY Purchase, the City of Rye, along with Eric Weaver, uh, who's a retired sergeant from the City of Rochester, who started much of the uh, CIT training within the, the state of New York. Uh, and we will continue to reach out to police departments at their request and attempt to meet all of their training needs. So we, we've been working to not only create the uh, CIT team, but we're looking to build out our CIT training team, knowing that there is quite a, quite a need or quite a demand for the training that's being delivered. Let's move on to the next slide. So our mobile crisis response teams, our mobile crisis response teams, once again, they're uh, a team of clinicians that will be uh, dispatched and co-located within different police departments. As we discussed before, we want to make sure that the right service is being deployed into the emergency, uh, being deployed for the, the specific emergency. We want to make sure that we get the right resources out there. Sometimes those teams will be dispatched independently. Sometimes they'll be dispatched along with law enforcement, dependent on the circumstance, dependent on the situation. Sometimes we'll be dispatched with EMS, depending on the circumstance and the situation. That telephone number for the mobile crisis response team is not available to the general public. If I'm living over in Portchester, I can't call over to the Portchester mobile crisis response team and say, can you come out and help me? But if I dial 911 or if I call the Portchester Police Department, that dispatcher, that desk officer now has this team at their disposal to send out to respond to that mental health crisis or the behavioral health crisis out there in the community. The, the um, crisis prevention response team, the 9255959 number, which uh, the rest of the world can call, is still going to be in existence. So if I'm, poor, I'm in Portchester and I don't want to call the police or 911, I can call 9255959, or I can call 988, and I'll get a member of the crisis prevention response team. But this will create a system by which we can deploy mental health professionals out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from the, the, from, uh, the police department itself. Just as we would uh, send out an ambulance, we would send out a fire department, this creates the option to send out mental health resources. Let's move to the next slide. So there, we've broken up the county into a number of different catchment areas, which I'm not gonna even try to begin to read from that screen. So you can move to the next one and I'll tell you the catchment areas based on uh, what we have. So. Uh, one of our one of the first teams to get up off the ground, and this really has to do with the partnership with the Department of Public Safety, uh, with uh, Sergeant Dress and Lieutenant Greer. And, was it Captain Greer? I think I just messed up. Captain uh, Captain Greer. I don't want to demote the guy. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, sure tell right him. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with their partnership, we were able to get. Uh, the some space over at over in Mount Kisco and the Mount Kisco team is going to be staffed by staff members of the Mental Health Association. They're going to provide services in Mount Kisco in Somers, Lewisboro, North Salem, Katona, Bedford, Pound Ridge, 
uh, North, North Castle and Newcastle, that whole swath of Westchester County that's up in the, uh, up in the eastern section of Westchester County. They have a team leader identified. They, uh, at this point, uh, are not operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're in the process of ramping up. They've been working really uh, closely with Eddie Ramirez from uh, County Department of Public Safety, who's the uh, community resource officer there to try to engage people. And I think we've got a great partnership moving forward. And I'm really, very, really excited about our partnership there. Uh, in fact, uh, we can even take a step back and look at the relationship with Lieutenant Steckmeister, where we're, we've been talking about uh, creating that, that CIT Center of Ex Excellence so that there's policies and procedures that support all the PDs throughout Westchester County when it comes to CIT. The New Rochelle team. We have had a co-response model in the city of New Rochelle funded through homeless funding, uh, PATH funding. Uh, we've got Mary Manchin, who sits in the in the city of New Rochelle already and has been working with Detective uh, Yadeline Machado uh, in reaching out to people who might be in crisis in the community. But now we also will have the Guidance Center's mobile crisis response team who will turn out of City Hall right next to the police department. They will be dispatched and they have also have a team leader. We've got office space ready to go for them. Uh, my buddy, Captain Charlie Nielsen in uh, the village of Portchester uh, has been tremendously gracious in making sure that the, uh, the space is available for the Family Services Westchester team. They're very excited to, uh, to get started. So the New Rochelle Police Department, let me go back to them. They're going to serve the, the uh, they're also going to serve not only the city of New Rochelle, but East Chester and Scarsdale. When it comes to Port Chester, they're going to serve uh, the city of Rye. They're going to see, serve Rye Brook, Harrison, Larchmont, Mamaronic Town, Mamaronic Village, SUNY Purchase. Uh, have I missed anyone? They've got the basically the Sound Shore and a little bit of an expanded expansion on the Sound Shore area. That's a family service team. Ossining Police Department, we've been in talks with Chief Sylvester over in the, with the Ossining Police Department to get the Family Service of Westchester team uh, up and running there. We're, we're working on space. They do have a team leader identified and we'd like to get started uh, there as well, but we're in the process of making sure that we have the appropriate space. And they're going to cover Briarcliff Manor, Mount Pleasant, Pleasantville, Sleepy Hollow. Uh, they also have um, Thornwood Valhalla. They have the, the, Mount, the Mount Pleasant uh, area going across. Uh, for the Peekskill area, the Peekskill team will turn out of the Peekskill Police Department. Uh, we've been working very closely with Chief Deluski to identify space uh, and to get their records shredded or something like that so that we can get the team into the space over there, which will be operated by Westchester Jewish Community Services. They're going to serve the city of Peekskill. Anything that Cortland, uh, that's covered by Cortland, which uh, includes jurisdiction, New York State Police, as well as uh, Westchester County Department of Public Safety. Uh, they'll also serve across, all the way across to Yorktown. Greenberg will serve everyone from the city of White Plains, including the city of White Plains, all the way out to the river. Uh, they're gonna operate through the uh, Mental Health Association of Westchester. They have a team lead uh, identified and we've been working really closely with uh, Danny Valentine over there in the, the uh, folks at the Greenberg Police Department to get that up and running. City of Mount Vernon is supposed to turn out of the Mount Vernon Police Department. Uh, we're a little bit delayed in the start with them because they took a unique approach. Not only did they have the um, the, the CIT that we delivered down there, but they developed their own wellness precinct. And that's been a focus for them for some time. So they're going to come aboard shortly, I anticipate, and they'll be staffed by uh, the Guidance Center of Westchester again. Uh, and they're going to cover not only the city of Mount Vernon, but Pelham, Brogsville, and Tuckahoe. And then finally, we've got the Yonkers team, which is an expanded team, uh, which will serve all of the city of Yonkers. It's operated by People USA who has been a great partner with, uh, with us with our crisis stabilization team over the past five years. And now they're also taking on the responsibility of the mobile crisis response team in the city of Yonkers. Uh, and they're the only team that will have one municipality just because of the fact that the city of Yonkers is so large. I believe at this point it's the third largest city in New York state. And we need to make sure that we have the appropriate resources for them. 
Let's move on to the next slide. I'm starting to get dry here. <laughs> right, so our um, accomplishments with our mobile crisis response teams. Uh, we had our, our uh, contracts executed with each of the teams. Uh, we've been working to identify the team leaders with each of the teams. Uh, we have a staff member within our department, Chris John, who is dedicated to getting these teams up and running and will take on other aspects of the uh, of Project Alliance moving forward. But launching eight mobile crisis response teams is a huge commitment, no matter how, um, how well we're partnered with our law enforcement partners and our EMS and emergency service partners. We've uh, had meetings with the MCRT, the local police departments. We've done some presentations out to some of the local communities and will continue to do so. Um, we've got good engagement from, uh, from the law enforcement perspective and they've really committed their personnel to making sure this law uh, is launched. Uh, we've got the development of CIT teams in many of the communities and com our community stakeholders have been involved each step of the way. And we've got great feedback from many of the uh, local leaders on the early interventions that we've had with the mobile crisis response teams, as well as a partnership with the community resource officers. I can't speak highly enough about the efforts of Eddie Ramirez in uh, the village of Mount Kisco for the, uh, for the Department of Public Safety. He's been a godsend in helping people who've been in, uh, in a state of crisis, and he's been a great partner, as has everyone within DPS. Uh, we are in the process of um, working with one of our one of our partner organizations to take a look at some of the data and evaluation because we want to make sure that we're doing this well and we're doing it right. So if our evaluation and data comes back and says that we need to tweak something, we can be responsive and create a system that makes the most sense for people within the community. The teams, as I said before, in the process of hiring staff. And we've had that kind of soft launch in some of the sites where we have the team leader who has begun to sit with the PDs to become familiar. We also recognize that we want to make sure that each of our team members has additional training. It's not the same as traditional clinic-based mental health services. To be a first responder, you have to, you have to really take on the ethos of a first responder, and you have to be immediately there to respond to that crisis in the community. And that means we have to change the mindsets and change some of the practices for many of the people within the mental health, uh, for many of our clinicians within the mental health system, as well as some of the peer supporters and other supporters that we have. And we anticipate that not only will we, we be um, providing them with additional training, but we're also talking about creating some tabletop activities so that they can begin to develop those relationships with the PDs that they're going to be serving. Mark, if I may add also, I just yeah, want to also the way the, mobile, the way the mobile crisis teams were selected, we actually did a request for a proposal. Um, we had all of the county department uh, uh, leadership. We also had people with lived experience and family members on the committee. And we also had local PD representation. So it was done with a very large stakeholder group. They were all scored. And that's how we came up with the uh, identification of the mobile crisis teams. Um, Mark talked about really trying to develop the teams. Um, one of the challenges uh, has been really uh, hiring. Uh, we know the workforce, especially in this in this field, is, is a bit challenging. We also want to have a team that is linguistically, culturally competent, and as Mark said, really understands the nature of this work. So we are we are being patient, making sure that we hire the right people. Um, but we think in the long run, we'll have uh, teams that are really um, more equipped to do the work uh, that we're doing. But we're definitely in the hiring process. And all of the team leaders have been identified, which is a very positive. So I just want to add that note as well. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And I think as far as we go, we are down to our last slide, which is they've got, we've got some feedback that's come in from some of our trainees in 911 diversion training, as well as trainees within our CIT training. Uh, and we've had some feedback from some of the stakeholders out there in the community. And I'm not going to read the bubbles that are up there. You can take a look. But overwhelming majority of the feedback has been tremendously positive. Uh, we, we, we really attempt to deliver this training uh, from the perspective of both emergency services as well as mental health. We're delivering it in partnership. It lends to the credibility of, uh, of the training. 
and it, it speak we we're speaking the right language and we're making the connection with people and the reality is that many of the officers and many of the uh, dispatchers and call takers and other emergency personnel also have people within their own families who have mm -hmm. uh, concerns with mental health with substance use they may have children who have intellectual or developmental disabilities or adult children who have adult uh, who have intellectual or developmental disabilities so it's really resonated with the uh, with the trainees, whether it be the 911 diversion level or the full, full 40 hour CIT class. It's I, I don't think I've ever had a class that someone hasn't come up and relayed their own personal um, experience and sought out resources and looked for guidance on how to help their family members uh, work towards something that's meaningful for their recovery. So I, I think it's been a great partnership and, and I appreciate the support of everyone that's here in this room in the county executive's office, all of you that have been involved with it, within, the, um, within the police reform committees, as well as all of our partners in emergency services, as well as the Department of Public Safety. Those, those really have been our primary partners. We're looking to expand that partnership. I mean, we've got DSS, uh, as a partner within this as well, but I think there may be more of a role for us to partner moving forward. So there are great opportunities to, to make this really what, what the people of Westchester County need. If, if I could jump in for a second, and I know I, I jumped ahead in Mark's question slide, but um, listen, I know this has been a huge joint effort, but I just have to say, this wouldn't be happening without Mark. I mean, his professionalism, his passion, his dedication, his, his energy, as you can see. We are so fortunate to have him. And Mark, I just want to thank you for all you've, you've done in the past for us and all you're doing now. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would like to hold up questions until the end um, as we now transition to our next PowerPoint that Copper is going to share on his screen screen for everybody to see. And this is now the segment of the meeting that we are going to highlight um, some of the recommendations that have been implemented within the past year um, and talk about how they've been implemented and where we are right now. Um, as Copper, you can continue with the next slide. So before uh, I give the floor to the virtual floor to Mayo and Leroy, <laughs> Um, I wanted to just give a recap of where we were as of January 12th, 2021. Um, that was the last time that the 36 member task force met to vote on recommendations. And these recommendations, as you may recall, um, were created from the six working groups that we had put together and they were community engagement, policies and procedures, transparency, training and equipment, qualifications and recruitment, and accountability and wellness. And as you may recall, there were 51 recommendations that were included in the report, which were then sent to the Board of Legislators uh, so that it would navigate their own approval process. Right before they had confirmed and, and, and certified um, and put their seal of approval in this report, they also added a 52nd recommendation, which had to do with taking action uh, to review county police for membership in white supremacist or other hate groups. So this particular recommendation um, came onto the group of recommendations that were submitted for uh, executive action. Um, and therefore, we had 38 recommendations for, uh, that were referred for executive action. There were seven recommendations that were referred to the County Board of Legislators and seven that were referred to the New York State delegation. We successfully met our deadline and submitted the full report to New York State on April 1st of last year. Right away, the implementation process began, and I had mentioned before, um, we had um, approached implementing these recommendations in different ways. Um, and after further review, what we had done was to actually um, take recommendation number three that was originally referred to the BOL, which had to do with responding to mental health calls countywide, and putting that in the group for executive action. 
And that was what we then transformed into Project Alliance. And then furthermore, we had recommendation number 33, which was originally referred for executive action that we then referred to New York State because it required action regarding state civil service rules, which is something that we cannot do at this level of government. So therefore, the breakdown of, of our 52 recommendations um, resulted in 38 for executive action, six to the Westchester County Board of Legislators, and eight that were recommended to New York State. And with respect to our implementation status, uh, as we focus on the first 38, uh, you will see that we have 33 that have been reviewed and implemented by the county's uh, Department of Public Safety. We have our one recommendation that was transformed into Project Alliance, and we have four remaining recommendations that are currently under review by DPS. And now I give the virtual floor to Mayo and Leroy, and they're going to highlight some of these recommendations that were sorted by working group. Mayo, Leroy. Thank you very much, Blanca. And I think that uh, I just wanna thank again, uh, you know, Commissioner Orth and Director Giuliano and uh, Commissioner Gleason. I think that the presentation regarding Project Alliance just gave us an opportunity to see how involved it is uh, to implement the recommendations and sometimes how much it, it involves working with other municipalities and the shared services aspect of it. And uh, I just think it's been, it's been a real pleasure working with you and watching you uh, put this together. And I understand clearly there's going to be a lot more going forward in terms of implementation. Uh, but the implementation is, is at least as important as the recommendations themselves. And I think that uh, Project Alliance in my estimation is phenomenal and is going to be very helpful. And I'll just tell you, I've had uh, personally the opportunity to observe officers who have, um, who have had the training and to watch them interact with some of my clients and, and to do it virtually flawlessly. So I just wanted to share that. And then I'll move into uh, the community engagement. Uh, and from that working group, um, We've provided, we have, these are things that we've actually implemented. So one of them is to provide implicit bias training and intercultural competency training. Uh, another is uh, training facilitation and recognition that it should be a team approach between experts and law enforcement. And again, uh, Director Giuliano spoke about the importance of that and who's part of the team. Um, police enforcement should be positive and community oriented. And I think that even looking at some of the comments going back to the last slide for Project Alliance and looking at people who've been engaged in the work and how they were able to view their work differently, uh, I think is very important. And we should always uh, leave that possibility available so that we can look at how we can improve upon what we're doing right now. Um, looking also at a clear description of the role that the Westchester County Department of Public Safety plays in the municipalities that it actually polices, which is Mount Kisco and Cortland. And those uh, are specifically and explicitly uh, discussed on our website. And that was one of the things that we thought was very important was to make sure that we're communicating what we do uh, to people on the website so that they can go there and find it. And it's, it's very easy to find. And it goes into a description of, of what uh, the department does in those municipalities. Um, there's a review of the department's social media and it's used for community outreach. Uh, creation of community liaisons and training of SROs on implicit bias, restorative justice and mentoring. And uh, that was something that everyone thought was very important in terms of helping them to be not only uh, able to work with young people, but to potentially be ambassadors for the department and to hopefully reach young people who may become interested in careers in law enforcement. Uh, with respect to our policies and procedures working group, uh, and again, some of our working groups will have more um, than others because some of them will, will not necessarily have lent themselves to executive action. They may have been legislative or they may have gone to our state delegate delegation. Uh, but with respect to policies and procedures, we wanted to publicize information on, on how the department works on, make sure that that's publicized online, establish the use of peer review, uh, error management training, and uh, to strengthen whistleblower protections and um, there are conversations with Commissioner Gleason um, allowed us to understand that many of the things that we are talking about existed already, but we looked at how we might be able to strengthen them, how to enhance them. 
I'll turn it over to Leroy for the next working group. Yes, as to the uh, transparency working group, uh, we uh, the recommendation centered around uh, that non-confidential documents and data available make them available to the public and a commitment to transparency. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to uh, look at the uh, Westchester County Department of Public Safety's website uh, recently, but uh, uh, a lot of information has been placed on there. We stated earlier about the commissioner uh, doing certain things while we were in the process, such as uh, putting the police manual up on, on the website. And, uh, and there is a stated uh, com uh, uh, commitment to transparency that was uh, located initially in the uh, commissioner's uh, section of the annual report but there are plans on the way to put it out uh, um, uh, on the website in a prominent location. Additionally, um, we talked about implementing policies to educate public on uh, the Department of Public Safety's values, principles, and operations. Now, the, I, we're here to understand now that the policies implemented are uh, done so through the uh, uh, SROs, also through uh, social media, also through community relations unit, and uh, the numerous outreach events that they have had and continue to have, as well as strengthening and uh, continuing their relationship with uh, Neighbors Link. Uh, uh, additionally, the Westchester County Departments of uh, Public Safety's recruitment program was overall, overhauled. Similar, each time a presentation is given to any group, the Department of Public Safety presenters educate that group on the department's values, its principles, and its overall organization, thereby embracing uh, the idea even more of being uh, making sure that the public is uh, aware of uh, the efforts toward uh, transparency. We talked about also promoting and engaging more non-investigatory community uh, interaction. And so the uh, Westchester County Department of Public Safety now meets with the Mount Kisco mayor on a regular basis. Uh, it has a liaison, uh, a, uh, a patrol lieutenant who's in communication with uh, the mayor of Mount Kis uh, Kisco on a daily basis. And it, as, as I stated earlier, there's still that strong uh, relationship that exists between Le Neighbors Link and the uh, Department of Public Safety. Uh, we also talked about maintaining consistent community dialogue with the community's uh, uh, policies. Uh, and that was, it was covered under the uh, information that I just said. Again, uh, body cameras were very much uh, in use uh, at the time that the task force was meeting. And uh, we uh, recommended that uh, body cameras uh, 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 go to all police officers and dashboard cameras to all vehicles. Uh, uh, I think a lot of that was uh, already in place. Uh, all patrol cars now are equipped with uh, mobile video cameras and uh, uniformed police officers and first line supervisors are assigned body warden campus and have been in the past. Uh, and they're also being provided for plainclothes civil enforcement officers as, as well. Uh, the other was the establishing an open disciplinary process. Uh, to the extent, uh, again, the department has uh, consistently uh, within, uh, wanted to or sought to uh, be open and transparent. Uh, the idea being to uh, make it uh, clear that the public can see that this is this as well. And so, uh, the Westchester County Department of Public Safety has an open disciplinary process and uh, already does a number of the things that were part of the recommendation. Some, some of these are publish the procedures of the disciplinary process on the website, provide for anonymous and non-anonymous complaint procedures, provide a formal procedure by which a member of the public may compliment a police officer, implement a policy of providing for status updates to complainants upon request, implement a policy of speaking with the complainant prior to a final uh, uh, determination. And so you can see that the uh, idea of transparency is something that is embraced and continues to be embraced by the Department of Public Safety. You can go on to the uh, training and equipment slide. Uh, the 
one of the uh, things that we uh, suggested there was enhanced officer training. Again, we work with uh, Lieutenant Leongi Alongi, as well as uh, the commissioner throughout the time that they, we were there, and they've been totally open to uh, uh, opening up uh, how much training was being done and rearranging and 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 uh, putting in place a uh, number of the training as it related to uh, uh, implicit bias. Uh, additional crisis interven intervention training offered this fall, this past fall, with an extra in-service course. And two CIT courses, as you heard about earlier, were offered in the spring and two in the fall. And uh, there's a leadership course. A framework has been hammered out and the course content is still in the process of being developed, but they're looking to roll that out in early uh, uh, at some point this year. Uh, certainly as of December uh, 21st, uh, there had been 54 officers that had completed uh, the 40 hour course in uh, crisis intervention training, which is approximately 20% of the department as a whole and 35% of the uniform personnel. So we're happy to see uh, the uh, exactly the work that's being done in that area. We also rec recommend and develop a library of training uh, videos, and, a, and that has been completed. Uh, new videos training can be uh, developed as a per as pertinent issues come to light to join in that to put into that library. As of now, there's a library of a dozen or so hours of training videos, and that's going to be continuing on on an ongoing basis, uh, as I said. Uh, we ask that uh, uh, we ask to increase in-service training. My understanding is, as of now, there's not a plan to increase the requirements. The core requirements are based on New York State ed accreditation standard, which we, which the uh, county department doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, control over. However, uh, as noted earlier, uh, their training goes. Uh, above and beyond uh, the minimum requirements for the uh, the DCGS uh, puts out uh, or recommends uh, or, or requires, I should say. Increase uh, training for officers that are transferring in uh, to the Westchester County uh, Police Department. Uh, en enhanced orientation has been in place for about six months now, and uh, 12 uh, transfer officers have been trained to date using the, the new program, uh, the enhanced program that has been put into place. Uh, increased training hours for new recruits on procedural justice, cultural diversity, and bias related uh, crime. Training in these areas are accomplished by shortening or removing some topics that are no longer required. Uh, and this is what I referred to earlier. Or, uh, or require less by DCHS, JS, and inserting new blocks and in instruction on these particular areas. And uh, that's a welcome uh, uh, addition that uh, the uh, Department of Public Safety uh, is undergoing. Um, develop and implement the uh, Moli mobile police app. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, downloading the app. I have it on my phone. I encourage you all to do so as well. It was in development at the time that the uh, task force was meeting. Uh, I find it uh, very uh, user friendly. Uh, it is very impressive and uh, I, I, I see uh, and I hope uh, that uh, great things will come from uh, where uh, using it and going forward. Next slide. Qualifications and recruitment. Uh, the one rec recommendation was to promote service as a police officer uh, to the public and increase recruitment efforts. Uh, in addition to all the programs and initiatives that have been previously mentioned, <coughs> uh, for example, involvement with community groups, uh, community events, and social media. The uh, Westchester County Public uh, Public Safety has overhauled their recruitment efforts in the following areas. In the months leading up to the exam filing date, the uh, Department of Public Safety presents to a dozen or so of college community groups. The presentation includes a wealth of information, not just about the benefits of career in law enforcement, but also about what Westchester County Department of Public Safety officers do and the communities that they serve. Several of the groups to whom 
uh, they have presented, recorded the material with the department's permission, permission for further distribution. And as part of that effort, the uh, Department of Public Safety produced two uh, recruitment videos. And uh, we, during the course of the uh, uh, meetings at the task force, we were impressed and told about uh, the PAC program and we had uh, recommended that they enhance that program because it was doing uh, so well uh, there in Mount Kisco. And uh, my understanding is uh, what uh, the Department of Public Safety promoted their community outreach in Mount Kisco and outlined every effort in real time on social media for all to see and emulate. They have also shared the outreach, including the PAC program, Police and Community Together, uh, is what PAC stands for, with many local police agencies at their request. Mayor. Okay, thank you. If there are a few of the recommendations that are still under review, one of which is to um, to make the uh, website available in Spanish. So right now we don't have the full capability to do that, but that we are exploring the ability to do that. Uh, one of the others is uh, the training and equipment that's identifying liaison officers at each local police department who are trained to respond to hate incidents. Again, one of the challenges there is that it requires us to work with other departments. We're not in a position to dictate to other departments what to do, um, but we can certainly uh, meet with them and encourage them to have someone that's able to help. And you've seen a number of incidents around the county uh, where that could be beneficial. Uh, number of hate crimes that have made the news, unfortunately. Um, in terms of training and equipment, uh, also we've gone on to identify uh, officers, and thus far 32 departments have hate incident liaisons. Um, one of the concerns is that you have to in, in encourage them to have uh, the training for those liaisons. Uh, one of the others that has been that we are still working on is uh, Project ABLE. That's the active bystandership for law enforcement. And um, with respect to that, uh, we are still exploring how that may work. Uh, but it has not yet been implemented, but we're hopeful that it would be able to be implemented shortly. And it's considering uh, and reviewing this recommendation. And with respect to accountability and wellness, uh, it's to develop a county policy regarding the investigation of non-fatal police involved shootings. So the department is working collaboratively with uh, the local chiefs and commissioners to form a countywide police involved uh, shooting investigation team. I must just cut in and say that with respect to the local police departments and their hate incident liaisons, we are now up to 33 police departments with the village of Port Chester submitting their their person, uh, their liaison, uh, a couple of days ago. Great. Thanks. Uh, with respect to the Board of Legislators recommendations, uh, recommendation to update section 273-01 subsection 3 of the county public safety law in reference to hate crimes, and that deals with the training and equipment, and that was referred to the Legislation and, Pub and Public Safety Committee on April 11th, so that is being worked on as we speak. Uh, recommendation to establish universal records management system, and uh, that would be for the department uh, to, and the department is currently, I'm sorry, reviewing responses uh, for an RFP release, which will ultimately be reviewed and voted on by the Board of Legislators. And then with respect to New York State recommendations, uh, delivered copies and uh, virtually briefed Westchester County delegation on the recommendations referred to New York State in May. So we had that meeting. I think it's important also to mention that we've been meeting consistently uh, since April. And that's another reason that we wanted to have this meeting today is so that we could uh, at least uh, update you with respect to where we are. And some of the, uh, some of the recommendations will take a lot longer still to rep for us in order to uh, implement them. Uh, for instance, the Office for Police Accountability um, requires uh, legislative action and it requires action on the part of the law department and they have to work together to look at what we can do and how it might be structured. 
that's just one example of many others that may take additional time. Um, but it's important in my estimation to take the time to get it right then uh, to rush it out and then end up having to uh, immediately scrap it or to make significant changes early on. Okay, so uh, next steps, uh, of course, is to uh, all the recommendations. We, uh, we encourage everyone to review them. They are going to be accessible online. And although we've highlighted some of them tonight, uh, I encourage you to uh, look at them and uh, see uh, exactly what uh, implementation has been done. And uh, I'm so excited to have uh, sat and listened to uh, all of the work that Project Alliance has been doing to uh, get things moving there. And I'm uh, fully, uh, I, I can't wait, or oh, I can't wait, but I, I look forward, I should say, uh, to see it uh, being fully enacted by uh, mid-2022, uh, when, uh, when once they're able to get all the pieces of the puzzle together in one place. Uh, this is, as I said earlier, this is exciting to be a part of, to see that Westchester County is moving forward on its own without having uh, Albany or anyone uh, pushing or making requirements and things of that nature. So therefore it can be an example uh, for uh, the rest of the state and even uh, for other parts of the country as well. Thank you, Leroy and Mayo for going over this presentation. Before we go on to questions and comments, I just wanted to invite Commissioner Gleason to say a couple of words with regards to uh, the implementation of all these recommendations. Thank you, Blanca. And, uh, you know, thanks obviously to uh, the county executive. And as he mentioned early on, uh, a lot of these things are things that we were already doing and we just kind of looked at them uh, again through a different lens to see how we might be able to enhance or improve upon things that we were doing. And we let, got a, a lot of good uh, recommendations and feedback throughout this process. And as you saw, we've, you know, the things that, that we agreed were valuable, we implemented as, you know, some of them right during, during the uh, process. So, um, you know, we, we took it obviously very seriously and, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done and continue to do. Um, and even some of the things that we um, kind of went through this quickly tonight, but some of the things that we've implemented in, in the ways of transparency. One thing I learned early on it is, you know, just, just because we say we're transparent and, and we're not hiding anything, um, sometimes we're just not doing as good a job as we should be educating the public on what we do and how we do it. So we've kind of looked at that in, in a different light and again, putting additional things on the website and on our social media with different platforms that we use on social media, because really that's where you know, many people look to see what's going on and we're very hap happy that we have the app up and running now. And uh, so, so thank you. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're always willing to listen and to see how we can do things better. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, just so everybody knows, the name of the app is the Westchester County Police Department. So you can search for it and download it. Um, and Copper, would you mind telling our attendees how they can uh, ask questions or provide comments, please? So uh, thank you all again for, for coming and for sticking with us through our meeting so far. If you'd like to ask a question, please uh, use the chat function in the bottom right hand corner of the screen to indicate that you have a question. Uh, I will move you up to part to a uh, to participant status and you'll be able to share audio and video and you can ask your question there. Thank you so much. We will uh, wait uh, just a couple minutes here to give everybody an opportunity to indicate that they have a question. Any questions or comments before we wrap up? Uh, we have one question submitted so far, Blanca. Uh, I'm just going to give a, another moment to see if anybody else has uh, would like to speak, and then we'll go in order of who submitted them.
Okay, so the one question that we have at this time is from legislator Damon Marr. Damon, I am unmuting you at this time. Uh, it seems like you are in uh, through some sort of a function where you can sh only share audio, uh, but you should be able to speak now. Hi, you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crane. And, and thank you for your efforts, especially as, as well as everyone else. So I, my uh, concern was about the uh, labor market for these new crisis response teams. Do we, uh, you know, tight labor market all around and we want really great people uh, doing this. And well, question, I'll read the question. What, what salary range is being offered to members of crisis response teams? Who are our, when I say our competitors, who are the competitors for our vendors in this labor market? Uh, how, how, how are they paying the competitors? Are the are benefits competitive? Are we offering full-time positions to those who want it? Are we offering overtime to those who want it? I guess I can, I can if it's okay, take a, a first crack at that. And thank you, legislator. Um, I, the teams consist of a multi-discipline team. So we have folks who are peers. We have uh, licensed mental health people. We have team leaders. Uh, we have substance abuse. So, so the salaries uh, do vary depending on, on the role they play. Um, agencies have done a rate enhancement because of the type of work that it's not traditional clinic based. So there is increases. Uh, and we're also looking at um, other sources of support and funding um, as we develop um, sort of the, the, the teams. Um, reality, especially in the behavioral health field, we do know nationwide um, there's a shortage of psychiatry, the uh, licensed uh, clinical social workers. Um, so we're also doing sort of massive recruitment. Uh, the good and bad is that all of our uh, agencies across the board in the state are, are having challenges with the workforce. Um, we have seen an improvement just recently over, I would say, the last month or two, um, as there is some, if we call it normalcy within hiring and people getting settled. Um, we're happy all the team leaders have been hired. And as said, we're also looking um, for people with a different skill set, people who work well with community, uh, who reflect community and understand the nature of this work. Um, so it may take a little longer, but we're, we're confident to get the teams up and running. And it is an exciting area of work. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to add to that as well. Um, the other thing is we are looking at budget adjustments if needed, um, make this work as well within what we can do. I don't really have much more to add except for the fact that because the nature of the work is different, you have to seek out a certain kind of person that's willing to uh, get out into the street and into the community, not somebody who wants to sit behind a desk. In addition to that, uh, we've got people, we need people who are willing to work off hours. So from midnight to eight in the morning is always a difficult thing to recruit. Uh, many of our communities have a large uh, Spanish speaking uh, contingency. We want to make sure that we have people who, who can speak Spanish. So we're narrowing the pool each step of the way. People who don't want to be in an office, people who are willing to work midnight to eight in the morning and people who are now Spanish speaking on top. Our, um, our pool of hires is um, getting more and more increasingly specific, but each of the teams is doing a really great job at recruiting. I know that Chris has been working with the teams uh, to get them up and running in the vast majority of the teams have uh, have staff that are reflective of the community that they're going to be serving. So I, I'm really happy to see that. Are, are they, do you know whether they're from the particular communities uh, to any extent or? Do you mean uh, the, the, uh, the people the have employees, been, the been hired? Or are they, yeah. uh, do they live in the community in which they work? Yeah, or, or nearby. Yes, yeah. yes, the, the answer to that is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You got it. Thank, Thank you, Legislator Mark Copper. Do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, at this time, we have no other questions unless Legislator Mar wanted to ask his follow-up question that he submitted to me in the chat. No. It, 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 the, the other question about the uh, review board I asked before uh, Mayo got to that. And, uh, you know, it, it, he answered the question. 
Great, and with that, it's 7.34. We had originally scheduled this meeting from 6 to 7.30, so we are excited <laughs> that we were able to get all of this information and present it to all of you. We want to thank our co-chairs, Commissioner Orth, Commissioner Gleason, for joining us, Mark Giuliano, who's our DCMH superstar. Thank you so much, Mark. And of course, my colleague, Copper Crane, for handling the, all of our WebEx related connectivity. So thank you all. Have a great night and we'll be in touch soon. Take care.